Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning message. I hope this finds all of you doing well. We appreciate you so much being with us today. Uh, in your Bibles, in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, uh, we'll be looking at verses 35 through 42 to begin with, but we'll back up and look at some other verses in that chapter as well this morning. So uh, be ready to, to do a little page turning there uh, if you need to. But our focus this morning uh, will be on one of the most beautiful accounts uh, of bringing someone to Jesus in the entire uh, Bible, in the entire New Testament, of course. And we want to look at that today. So beginning in John chapter 1, verse 35, we find these words. Again, the next day after John, that's speaking of John the Baptist, stood and two of his disciples, two people that were following him, and these two disciples of John the Baptist were John, who wrote the gospel that we're reading right now, and his friend Andrew. And looking upon uh, Jesus as he walked, he, John the Baptist, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, John and Andrew, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. John the Baptist would have been very happy, you see, uh, that his disciples followed Jesus because Jesus was his very ministry. He was the core of what John the Baptist was doing. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, be an interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelled and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, which would have been four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two which heard John speak, which John the Baptist speak, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon. Now this is after he had left John the Baptist and was with Jesus, Andrew, okay? So get the picture here. He'd been following John the Baptist, listening to his preaching of one who was to come, and that was Christ. And now, of course, he was introduced to Jesus and now look at what Andrew does. Verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon, Simon Peter, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And look at what Andrew does. And he brought him, Simon Peter, to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. What a beautiful story this is of bringing someone to the Lord. Andrew brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. I read a story once, and I'm going to share this with you, about a Sunday school teacher named Ed Kimball. Ed, through his testimony and witnessing, had won a young man to the Lord Jesus this new believer began to understand the power of God upon his life and God used him in an absolutely miraculous way. The young convert was Dwight L. Moody, great preacher and evangelist. Alan Carr tells the story this way, preacher Alan Carr. The story says that after evangelizing America, D.L. Moody started in England. There in England, Frederick B. Meyer heard his message. One of the illustrations that Moody used did not at first stir Brother Meyer. Then one of his Sunday school teachers came to him and said, Brother Meyer, the illustration that that preacher gave in our church the other day stirred my girl so much that there's been a lot of weeping, confession, and testimony. We are sure that the Holy Spirit has come among us and we have had an experience in our class that you won't believe. Oh, dear friends, to have an experience like that again from God. F.B. Meyer was so affected by the testimony of that teacher and those girls that he got off by himself and soon it began to grip him in the same manner. His ministry began to open up and spread and as it did, he was invited to come to America. He came and went to Furman University to preach. One young fellow in the student body had decided to quit the ministry and go back to a secular job. 
but the message of F.B. Meyer was given with such fervor and flame that the young fellow stepped out, came forward, and renewed his vow to his calling. He was the great preacher R.G. Lee. Then F.B. Meyer went on to preach at another location. In that service, a young fellow caught fire and began to evangelize. His meetings spread all over the areas of New England and the mid-Atlantic coast until they were bulging at the seams. A great, great revival broke out under the preaching of J. Wilbur Chapman. Set on fire of God through the preaching of F.B. Meyer began to stir up the whole northeastern coast. Again, oh, for a revival in America like that. Then because of Chapman's preaching, he was invited to speak at a certain place. His ministry was changing, and he needed someone to move in uh, on those citywide crusades that he was holding. Someone said, the man you want is the young convert Billy Sunday. Oh, what a fireball Billy Sunday was. Billy Sunday Influenced by J. Wilbur Chapman, got into the ministry and went to Charlotte, North Carolina. There, a group of laymen got so inspired and stirred up that they organized a committee to invite other evangelists back. One invited was Mordecai Ham of Louisville, Kentucky. He preached in a meeting, and Billy Graham got saved. Billy Graham became a renowned evangelist around the world, all because... Listen now, get the point we're trying to make today. All because Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher in a local church, won one other rebellious shoe store worker and started a series of spiritual dominoes falling that ended up with millions saved in Moody's ministry, hundreds of thousands in Myers' ministry, hundreds of thousands more in Chapman's ministry, hundreds of thousands more in R.G. Lee's ministry, and tens of millions more in Graham's ministry, all because one fellow won one soul to Christ. It is certainly possible to change the world via the avenue of sh simply sharing your faith and inviting another human being to come to Jesus. Preacher Alan Carr. So is there any such person as a nobody in the kingdom work? No, absolutely not. We simply don't know who may be sitting right here this morning in this place who God may stir up to be the next great evangelist of our day. We simply do not know whether that person God may put in our daily paths to tell about Jesus could be the next Billy Graham and oh, how we need that to happen. That's an amazing story, how God miraculously used common men to lead men to Christ that became extraordinary men in bringing millions to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, millions have been saved, and because of their ministries, men, women, boys, and girls are still coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. And how are they coming to this saving knowledge even after all of these great preachers have gone to heaven? Because there are still those Ed Kimballs in our world today. Those who are, for the most part, unknown to the rest of us. But because of their dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for the souls of lost people are still sharing the glorious message of hope, the gospel of Jesus. That's how the message is still getting out. And as we see in our text, that's exactly how Simon Peter got saved. Andrew, his own brother, brought him to the Lord Jesus. In our scripture today, we understand that Jesus' earthly ministry is in its beginning stages. John the Baptist has been preaching of the coming of the Lord. So now I want us to look back and, and give you a brief history of of how this has all unfolded in the, uh, a few previous verses in the same chapter. Many people of that time thought that John the Baptist uh, might be the Messiah because of his preaching and teaching, or at least one of the great prophets. But in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 1 of John, uh, he clearly states 
that he is neither the Messiah nor one of the ancient prophets. Look at what it says, uh, John 1, 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. In verse 21 he says, And they asked him, What then? Are thou Elijah, or Elias, or Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. You see, he was here under the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the same spirit that led Elijah to preach, uh, but he was not Elijah. He was in the spirit of Elijah, the Bible tells us. And then notice in verse 23, he begins to give uh, these uh, his true mission, and that is to pave the way for the coming of Christ. Verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And what he's referring to, Isaiah, the prophet, prophesied this event around 700 years before it happened. He prophesied that, if you want to read it for your reference, in Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, verse 3. He illustrates the greatness of, of one to come when John the Baptist says in John 1, 27 that he is not worthy to unloose the latchet of this man's shoes, not even worthy to untie the shoes of Jesus. And then moving on down the page, beginning in verse 29, John bears record of some very important events. Uh, in verse 29, one of the most profound statements in, in the whole Bible is stated when he, John the Baptist, proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Oh my, that, my sin's included in that statement. Yours is included in that statement. The whole world's sin from the time of Adam and Eve to the last person, Jesus' blood, his redemptive power, has taken away our sin. Then John the Baptist bears record of the Spirit descending upon Jesus as a dove and abiding there. And in verse uh, 34, he again bears an all-important record of Jesus' deity, and that is the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Now, I went through those verses briefly there that precede our focal text for two reasons. First, to get in our minds what was going on as far as what John had been preaching and teaching, and then to help us realize that there were two men who had been hearing and following this preaching and teaching of John the Baptist who were about to see firsthand uh, just what uh, he had been talking about and how he is beginning to fade out of the picture. You see, John said that he must decrease, that Christ must increase. And that's exactly what's taking place. In this transitional picture, uh, we'll see that when a person comes to know Christ as Savior, that person will desire, my friends, listen, that person will desire to see someone else come to know Christ as Savior also. We're going to see how a personal testimony can bring another person to Christ. And not only that, we'll see that one personal testimony may just bring one of the greatest preachers and soul winners in the, in the history of man to the Lord. And that happened with Billy Graham. So let's look back a few moments at our focal uh, text. Again, uh, the next day after John, John the Baptist stood and two of his disciples, John and Andrew, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he, John the Baptist, saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him, heard John the Baptist speak these things, and they followed Jesus. You know, I kind of get this picture here. When John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, and Andrew and John, uh, uh, the apostle, heard what he said, I believe he is saying to them, Guys, you know what I've been preaching about one is coming who is greater than I well that's him right 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 yonder he is it's him you need to follow because look at their actions they followed him not a man or a preacher or a prophet but the lamb of God and look at what Jesus response to their following is then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, of course, which is being interpreted as master, 
or master teacher, where where are you staying? Where where are you? Where where dwellest thou? What seek ye? What a question. You know that question is still as powerful today as it was when Jesus asked these two men, isn't it? What seek ye? The yearning of the human heart still seeks a higher power. Whether people admit it or not, whether they deny the power of God or not, there is still a deep need inside the human soul. The tragic thing, though, is the fulfillment of that need has been offered, but billions, yes, billions, still reject our Savior. What happens here? Well, they ask Jesus where he lives, where are you dwelling? And then comes the invitation. Listen, dear church, dear listener today, the Lord Jesus still extends this invitation. Look at what he says. Come and see. Come and see. Can we even begin to imagine that conversation and the power of God upon that place that afternoon? Can you imagine the life-changing power of sitting down with Jesus and have him personally give the invitation to come to him? Thank God he still does, dear friend. Not in human form, we see with human eyes, but certainly in the person of the Holy Spirit, he is still giving the invitation to come and see. Then, of course, we see in the next verse, verse 40, one of the men following Jesus was Andrew. And who was Andrew? Well, he was the brother of none other than Simon Peter. Notice now what happens after Andrew has met the Lord in typical Andrew form. Oh, to be an Andrew. He brings another person to Christ and this person is his own brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, verse 41 says, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is interpreted, or being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. I want to ask you this morning, was there ever a time after you met Christ that you wanted others to meet him? And have that same abundant joy that you had? I hope that's still going in and on in each of your lives today. But maybe after you were a Christian for a while, that desire to see others come to Christ has somewhat faded. Maybe you have given up on some people and in that have become discouraged to share your faith. This morning, there may be some of you that have family members uh, that you don't feel the uh, feel knows know the Lord, and you have a very hard time talking to them about Jesus. It is difficult, no doubt. But who was the first person Andrew went to after he met Jesus? His own dear brother. He loved Peter, didn't he? We love people, don't we? We love our family. We love our family members who may be lost. These men, you see, were common fishermen. And as we've seen and studied the life of Peter in Scripture for years, we understand his personality was outspoken and hard-hearted at times. You know, it may have been hard for Andrew to take the initial step toward sharing Christ with Peter, but he did. Have you taken the step toward bringing family members and close friends to Jesus? It may be one of the most difficult things uh, you do, but we need to, don't we? And somehow, we need to. We must show genuine compassion. We must show genuine concern. We must show genuine love for the lost. May I ask you in all humility today, how many do we see at this altar on Sundays and cry out to God 
for lost family members and friends. There are a few. There are a few that come and ask me to pray with them about their family. How important is it for us to reach them? That's our own personal question. Do we believe in an eternity that people will spend one of two places, heaven or hell? Let me ask you today, simply, will you dare to be an Andrew? Will you dare to go to your family member or your close relationship that you have a concern about their eternity and share Christ with them? Will you leave this place with a new desire to bring others to Jesus? You never know. You may be sharing Jesus with the next Dwight L. Moody or the next Billy Graham. Oh, what a tragedy it would be to get to heaven and stand before Christ and he say to us, you broke the link of the chain by not mentioning my name to that boy or that girl or that man or that woman who had the testimony for the next one to know Christ. And the next one may have been a great evangelist to lead millions to Christ. You see, dear friend, what you may not understand, it wasn't the only, the one that God put in our way to witness to that may not have made it to heaven, but all of those through that person's witness that may not have made it to heaven. That's a sobering thought today. But my friend, we need to consider it. Jesus left us work to do, and that work is to share the good news, the glorious gospel, the love of Christ for humankind. Just as he's done for us, we need to testify of his goodness, don't we? So others can come to know him. God bless you today until we speak again.